Welcome to the opening ceremony of the 16th Astley Conference. For those of you who may have just arrived, allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Arif Jamal, and I'm a member of the faculty here at NUS Law. And I have the privilege of being your Master of Ceremonies for today's opening ceremony. To begin, it is my pleasure to invite the Dean of NUS Law, Professor Simon Chesterman, to deliver his welcome address. Dean Chesterman. Minister Keishan Muga, Minister for Home Affairs and Law, uh, Professor Igimi, Professor Bell, members of the Asley Board of Governors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Singapore. Uh, it's a privilege for us at NUS Law to host the Asley Conference once again, bringing leading scholars from around the region and beyond to the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. We're also thrilled to have a, a strong turnout of younger scholars representing the next generation of legal academics. The theme of this year's conference, the rule of law and the role of law in Asia, reflects the diversity of legal research and legal experiences across the continent. Every country in Asia embraces the rule of law in theory, for example, but differences routinely arise as to what that means in practice. The conference agenda similarly spans jurisdictions and subject areas, as well as perspectives and methodologies. Uh, we have topics looking at issues from indigenous law to autonomous vehicles, we have representatives from across the region, including very old established law schools and some of the very newest law schools, uh, including among others, the Jigme Singye Wangchuk School of Law in Bhutan, uh, and a particular welcome to them. I do hope during the conference you find a selection of topics to suit your own interests, as well as presenting your own work. But I also hope that you see more of Singapore than just our auditorium and our seminar rooms. The conference takes place on the historic Bukatima campus of NUS, once home to an entire university, uh, this facility now barely contains the School of Law and the School of Public Policy. Listed as a national monument, the campus nestles on the edge of Singapore's only World Heritage listed site, the stunning Botanic Gardens. So please do make time to explore them both. Before I end my very brief welcome remarks, let me just say a few thank yous. First to Minister Kei Shanmugam, a graduate of the class of 1984, uh, for setting aside time to speak to legal experts from across the region. Uh, you and your ministry, in particular the Ministry of Law, have been unstinting in your support of legal education and research in Singapore, but also visionary in seeing how Singapore benefits from supporting legal education and research across our region through networks like the Asian Law Institute or ASLI. Secondly, let me thank the ASLI Board of Governors. We had a very productive meeting yesterday. Uh, in particular, thank you to our chair, uh, represented today by Professor Mariko Ugimi. Thirdly, let me thank the staff of NUS Law who've made today possible. If things go well, it's because of all their work. Uh, if things go wrong, it's my fault. Uh, thank you in particular, uh, the, the list is in the back of the program, but thank you in particular to Melinda and Jaya, who I think are running around making sure things are working. Thank you to Jacqueline Neo, the Deputy Director of ASLI. Uh, and let me just pause for a moment to thank Gary Bell. Um, as many of you know, Gary, uh, has, been, has an extremely long history with the Asian Law Institute. He was deeply involved in the creation, serving as its founding director, among other things, coming up with the name. Uh, the Asian Law Institute, you could have different acronyms like Ali and so on, but ASLI in Malay and Indonesian means native or from the place. Uh, and this was very much the vision of ASLI, that we would have an Asian Law Institute grounded in and connected to the region, as opposed to uh, located outside the region, which is where previously many Asian law centers had been, uh, had been located. Gary served as director from 2003 to 2008 and 2010 to 2011. Uh, and after much persuasion, uh, he returned to the position for a third champion lap uh, in 2016. This lap, if you like, uh, over the past three years has seen an extraordinary growth in the Asian Law Institute. We now have more than 100 members from across Asia and beyond. Uh, and so I wouldn't be really doing my job if I didn't take this very high profile opportunity to thank him for the extraordinary effort and enthusiasm that he's brought to this role over many, many years. So please join me in thanking Gary for his efforts. As I said at the beginning, on behalf of all my colleagues at NUS Law, we are deeply honored to be hosting this important event. We will strive to make it a success. If there's anything we can do to improve your experience here, please do let us know. The last group I wish to thank is all of you, our peers and our colleagues and our future from across the region and beyond. I hope, like me, you find this annual event inspiring and that you will leave it with new ideas, new energy, and in particular, new friends. Thank you all very much.
Thank you, Dean Chesterman. May I now uh, invite Professor Mariko Igmi, who is Vice Dean of the Faculty of Law at Kyushu University, to deliver her welcome comments, uh, representing the Chairman of the Astley Board of Governors. Proceed. As this year's Chair of the Astley Board of Governors meeting, but also on behalf of all the particip participants of the 16th Astley Conference, I would like to express our profound gratitude to the Dean Chesterman of the National University of Singapore, Professor and Director Bell, and all the colleagues and staffs of Singa uh, in the US who had this fascinating event possible again. We have to bear in mind as participants uh, that they are not only hosting us, but taking the initiative to run the ASLI itself. It is a tremendous work. I asked Gary yesterday, are you sure you want to do this every four years? But they're running ASLI with such a success. As a matter of fact, we, the participants from Kyushu University, flew in, flew in on Sunday under the maximum security, G20, leaders of finance meeting in Fukuoka. And if you look at their group picture, it tells the outcome of the uh, meeting itself with all the issues like China, US, Be uh, Brexit, a little bit of Nissan, etc. The only people who are really smiling are two Japanese gentlemen, the chairs. They looked so happy that it's over. <laughs> In the case of our Board of Governors meeting, we were all smiling, not only me, I hope. We were all very happy and satisfied of the progress Ashley made. And I'm looking forward to seeing your smile at the end of two days of hard work when this year's conference comes to an end. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a very pleasant and productive conference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gimi. Uh, we now have a welcome speech from somebody you may have heard of. His name is Gary Bell, and he's the director of Ashley, a dear friend and colleague. Professor Bell, if you would. Minister for Home Affairs and Minister of Law, Dean of the Faculty of Law, Chairperson and members of the Board of Governors, and dear colleagues. Welcome to the 16th Annual Conference of the Asian Law Institute. And also, I'm very glad to say, welcome to my law school. As it was created at the initiative of NUS, but with collaboration with, with top law schools from all over Asia. Before ASLI, as was mentioned by the Dean, most conferences on Asian law were taking place in the West, outside of Asia. And we wanted to create a place in Asia, so it was conceived as a forum for Asian law in Asia, by Asians, mainly for Asians, but open to the whole world. The world, as I mentioned by the Dean, and I thank the Dean for delivering about a third of my speech, <laughs> but, but uh, Asli means indigenous. It means from here in Malay and um, in Indonesian and some other Asian languages. It comes from Sanskrit, actually. I remember the very, very first uh, Asli conference uh, 15 years ago. I was at founding director and organized the first conference. And we thought, you know, it was the first one, how many people will come, we weren't sure. There was a hundred papers presented at the very first conference. Uh, it was a smaller thing than today, but still, uh, 70 different law schools were represented. So it was quite clear very quickly that ASLI was something that was needed in this region. ASLI has grown over the year. This year's conference has reached records. 567 abstracts were submitted for this conference, and uh, we've accepted 358, and 
about 250 of you will present papers um, today, and there's about 350 uh, people who are registered. And all, all arrive, some will arrive tomorrow, but uh, there are 300, um, over 300 people are registered. ASLI has grown, as was mentioned. We have now 106 law schools are member of ASLI. And also, we have a fellowship program I've mentioned quite a few times. We've had, in total, 120 ASLI fellows. These are people who come to NUS uh, and do research here with other fellows from the region. Um, many of them have become dean of their law school, and there are some of them are here today. Uh, dean Perina um, from Chula uh, Dean Chan from National Chao Tung University, Dean Vicha, the former dean of University of Indonesia, uh, Dean Topo, and there are many, many people who were ASLI fellow and have yet to become dean of their law school. <laughs> uh, I often say that if you want to become dean, you should apply for an ASLI fellowship. And if you're interested, uh, the deadline is 27 of June. <laughs> I'm also happy to report that the Journal of ASLI, the Asian Journal of Comparative Law, is doing extremely well under the leadership of my colleague and friend, Dan Puchniak. This year, after the conference, ASI will hold its first Asian, junior faculty, Asian Law Junior Faculty Workshop in collaboration with the NUS Center for Asian Legal Studies. We received more than 300 abstracts from young colleagues who wanted to participate in the workshop, and in the end, we chose only eight. And these people will have very senior colleagues on Asian law commenting on their paper throughout uh, the, 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 the day of the conference, the, the workshop. Now, as the governors have met yesterday, and the news are all good, <laughs> they're very happy with things the way they are doing, um, come to the open forum this afternoon at 1.45, and I will give you more news about ASLI and the projects we have, and the journal will also, Dan Pushniak, the editor-in-chief, will explain to you what's happening with the journal, and following that, uh, we will have uh, the best article of the journal from last year will be presented to us by the author. So I invite you at 1.45 to come for this. Now, uh, the Dean has mentioned that I've been uh, director of ASCII for three times thus far. And my term expires at the end of this month. And although the Dean has tried to convince me uh, yet again to continue as director of ASCII, I really would look forward to having more time for my own research on Asian law. And therefore, I've asked the Dean to uh, be allowed to step down. So I'm. Uh, I will step down at the end of this month. Uh, ASI is in very good shape, so I think it's a good time, an appropriate time, to actually pass uh, the baton to a new leadership. Uh, the deputy director, Jacqueline Yeo, who's been assisting me all this time, uh, will also be stepping down uh, because she's taking new responsibilities with it, and U.S. that will keep her very busy. Uh, and I thank her very much for her service uh, as deputy director. Let me introduce the new director and deputy director as of 1st of July. Um, my very good friend and colleague, Wan Zhang Yu, please stand up. <clears throat> and uh, he will be assisted by uh, Kelby Roy, another colleague from NUS. <clears throat> please uh, use the time during the coffee breaks, etc., to introduce yourself uh, to the new team. Now, let me introduce our guest of honor and my good friend, uh, Mr. K. Shamugam, Minister for Home Affairs and Minister for Law. You have a brief biography in the brochure, but let me give you a few highlights. Minister Shamugam graduated from this law school at the top of his class with first class honors in 1984. He went into private practice and became one of the senior partners and head of litigation and dispute resolution at Allen and Gillette Hill, which was at the time the largest law firm in Singapore. In 1998, he was appointed senior counsel of the Supreme Court. It's something like Queen's Counsel in England. Um, and he was appointed at the age of 38, which is uh, the youngest uh, lawyer so appointed. He was one of the top litigation, arbitration, and insolvency lawyer in Asia, in Singapore. Prior to accepting to become a minister, Mr. Shamugam has also served at the, as on the advisory board of this faculty of law. On 1st May 2008, Mr. Shamugam was appointed as cabinet minister. He is now the Minister for Home Affairs and the Minister for Law, but he has also served in the past as Minister for Foreign Affairs. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the Minister 
and to thank him for accepting our invitation to speak to you today. Minister, thank you. Professor Simon Chesterman, Professor Gary Bell, and Professor Mariko, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me here to join you. Let me touch on three points. Uh, economic growth in Asia, the rule of law as well as the role of law in that context, and the opportunities for Singapore. I apologize for bringing Mammon into this temple of academia, but you know, inevitably, in the economy, economic growth is linked inextricably with the framework of law. And uh, my, from where I sit, that's a crucial perspective. And how we see uh, the law playing an important role in helping to develop Asia and people's lives. If you look at economic growth in Asia, something that many of you will be aware of, but worth being reminded on, January of this year, Stan Chart projected that Asia's share of global GDP will grow to 35%, and that would be matching the that of the Euro area and US combined. That's about 10, 11 years away. Uh, earlier, perhaps more optimistic uh, prediction by ADB was that that share of global GDP would in fact be 40% by 2030 and perhaps 50% by 2050. I think one discounts projections up to 2050, but in 2020, 2025, 2030, these are all markers. And uh, by many matrices, ASEAN's own GDP is probably now in the top five, top six in the world. And ASEAN's economic growth since 2000 stands at 5.3% annual average, far higher than the global average of 3.8%. And it's a young population. Uh, the factors for growth are in place, and it's likely that uh, that growth will accelerate. Some projections will place ASEAN as the fourth largest economy in the world by 2030 after the US, China, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, Germany, or Japan, one of the two. Uh, if you look at specific countries, the Vietnamese economy grew by 7.1%. It's the fastest growing economy in ASEAN, and it's now become the second largest uh, electronics exp exporter in ASEAN, just behind Malaysia. China, of course, the story is well known. No country in history has lifted so many people, 850 million people, out of poverty within such a short period, 30 years. Something that is frequently overlooked when people look at China. Indonesia, in the next five years, is planning a record $400 billion in infrastructure spending. Just vignettes for you to think about. There will be ups and downs, and we have the global uh, trade war that's uh, started. There is a mode of uncertainty. It's affecting the economies in many countries. But the secular trend, the undoubted secular trend for this region, ASEAN, as well as Asia, is upwards. And for that to continue, the law, the framework of law, is going to play a very important role. Place. Investors want certainty. They want uh, to know that if there is a dispute, there is a place where it can be dealt with. And uh, they want confidence in legal systems. Within Asia, there are different legal systems. There are different ways of approaching the law and uh, different levels of confidence in the uh, judiciary. And therefore, it's likely that investors will look to the entire region and then perhaps deal with their disputes and uh, place themselves in a location where they are absolutely confident that they will be safe, their money will be safe, and that there is rule of law. And I think Singapore stands uh, well ahead 
of any competition in that context. People feel safe here. They can come in, they can go out. Their money is safe. And very often, uh, they see Singapore as a place where disputes from all around Asia can be resolved through a variety of means, arbitration. We have now got the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which will come into force in August. It's an ancestral UN-supported convention. So mediation is a, uh, very strongly on our radar as a more Asian way of doing things. And of course, we've set up the Singapore International Commercial Court for those who want to go to court to dispute, resolve their disputes uh, as opposed to private arbitration. And SICC is specifically set up to deal with uh, international uh, commercial disputes with a panel of judges drawn from all over the world, both in, from the civil law as well as the common law systems and Asian as well as uh, Western. So that this growth Therefore, present this growth in ASEAN, Asia, coupled with the uh, sort of varying levels of confidence in the different legal systems, uh, knowledge, access to confidence, presents Singapore with enormous opportunities. Let me just give you two examples. If you take infrastructure and projects, ADB has estimated, and the estimate was given in 2017, that. Uh, Asia will have to invest about US $1.7 trillion per year to maintain its growth. Even if it doesn't spend $1.7 trillion and spends half of that, that's still a lot of money. And a lot of money is going to be spent every year for several years, up to at least 2030. That means there's going to be a huge growth uh, in allied services, because you need to finance them, you need to provide legal services, you need to provide the, all the other services that supports such uh, project uh, conceptualization and management and execution. That's just one area. If you look at a second area, debt restructuring. With economic growth, debt restructuring market will also develop. Uh, Oliver Wyman uh, did a study say the current uh, amount of debt for restructuring is uh, already at about US $250 billion. And that's going to grow as well. And again, it will dri drive a significant demand for professional services, including legal services. We are very focused as a government on this, We're working with the private sector. And we have taken some steps to tap onto these opportunities. We will take more. Last year, we launched the uh, infrastructure office as part of the budget. We set aside money for it. This is uh, an office that hopes to bring together the stakeholders and facilitate infrastructure investments, financing. And, you know, these things can uh, succeed if we work closer with the academia as well, because the thought leadership in these areas is also important. So there's going to be a, a huge demand for law firms with project financing and infrastructure dispute resolution expertise. So we intend to push ahead um, with that, with the Ministry of Finance and my ministry working closely together. If you look at insolvency and debt restructuring, again, we have made significant changes to our legislative framework, taken a number of steps. In fact, Singapore was named uh, the most improved jurisdiction for infrastructure a couple of years ago. And amongst the uh, judges, a judicial insolvency network that connects Singapore to some of the top international jurisdictions in this field was set up in 2016. It's a forum for judges to exchange views and develop best practices. Again, we are positioning ourselves as thought leaders in this aspect, in this region. Uh, people know when you do cross-border uh, transactions, there would be increased levels of complexity. In fact, complexity characterizes much of the economic activity that drives growth in Asia. So all of the professional services that support such growth will need to respond. And uh, for legal services, I'll highlight two uh, aspects where we are focusing. There are many more that we are focusing, but I'll just highlight two. First. I mentioned this earlier. For us to be an international legal services hub and to enhance it, 
we have to strengthen our position as a dispute resolution center. We have to grow new areas of international legal services out of Singapore. And third, promote the use of uh, Singapore law. Second, we need to develop jurisprudence on Asian legal systems that addresses the needs of businesses operating in Asia so that business people will understand the different legal systems, where they are going, how they are fused, to what extent there is commonality. And in that second aspect, if you look at the larger context of economic growth, and then you look at the specific context where there are uneven, uh, varying degrees of confidence in the different legal systems and expertise, then you see that there also has got to be a need for confidence and understanding and certainty. Then there is a gap. And that gap is where academics can play a very significant role. Institutes like this, academics, can help bridge that gap. So it's an incredibly exciting time to be involved in these developments. Uh, my ministry regards it as uh, crucial to support work in this area. So we supported last year, for example, the launch of the ASEAN Law Academy here in NUS. And uh, beyond the funding that is provided by MOE for the running of the law faculty, We've decided to top up over several years now, six years, a very significant amount of funding from Ministry of Law direct to the NUS law faculty to fund the study and developing thought leadership in Asian legal studies. The purpose of that funding was to build up a pool of local law academics with specialist law knowledge to deepen the expertise uh, and strengthen leadership in identified areas. And really the hope is that that will help establish centers of excellence in Singapore. And they will in turn contribute to developing high quality academic leadership on the legal uh, regimes around the region and to help Singapore being uh, play its natural role as an important, perhaps the most important legal center in the region. And my ministry and the government are all deeply committed to that project. So it will involve having best of class experts located in Singapore, having expertise in common law and civil law systems, and on the specific laws of the countries around the region, Asia, but particularly Southeast Asia, and ASLI, as well as other centers, can play a very significant role in that. Now, I hope to see NUS leading that effort and giving the centers its full support. As something we will have continuing discussions with NUS, as well as the other universities. They have a role as well. And there must come a time, the challenge is there must come a time when you think of Asian legal systems, you think of Singapore as a place where everyone gathers. And so I'm very glad to see a conference like this gathering together. I'm told it's the most successful conference to date. We ought to be able to attract the very best, first to be located in Singapore, second, of course, they will also be in other countries, to come together regularly in Singapore to exchange ideas so that in future, in terms of the economic activity, economic development, it helps the countries around the region to develop as well. And we can play a significant role in that. It's good for them. It's obviously good for us. So I hope that you will have a fruitful conference. Thank you for inviting me here today. And that's the context in which I wanted to share my thoughts. Thank you very much.
I wish you a very, very good conference, and I wish to see all of you at the open forum at 1.45. Thank you.